we are finally back to focusing on U.S. economic data. Welcome, everyone. This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And this is the moment that we've been waiting for. All week, the markets have been in a kind of soggy state. Uh, we've been waiting for some kind of clarity on um, U.S. monetary policy, because, of course, we'll talk about why this is important. Uh, this is what we've been focused on all week as far as what's been motivating markets. But we've been operating somewhat blind. Because what we've not had is some kind of a uh, view on updated macro data to actually inform opinions. Well, that changes now. Because what we are now going to look at, finally, is a bit of substantive economic data. So what we... Uh, are focusing on here, of course, is going to be the PCE inflation report. This is uh, the Fed's favored inflation gauge uh, to see what it might give us for an actual uh, guidepost to benchmark what we're looking at. So first, we'll take a look at what is expected. We'll take a look at what that might do and how these things have been motivating markets, both uh, in terms of looking at uh, their market moving potential and the scenarios for uh, what each one might be, and then consider whether we then have something with significant continuation risk because, of course, this release will mark the last substantive piece of data on this conversation for another week. The Fed meets on June the 13th. Next week, after a flurry of commentary from Fed officials, they go silent for the week-long commentary blackout period ahead of a policy announcement. And they stay silent for nearly two weeks until that policy announcement on the 13th with the jobs report due at the end of next week as the only kind of waypoint in the middle. So this data is going to be absolutely critical in terms of setting the markets on some kind of a course. Let's see what we're expecting first and foremost. Here's the PCE index. You can see the breakdown between housing, energy, food, core services, and core goods. And of course, you can see here with the naked eye that the inflation situation is a story about core services. Housing, of course, is still a meaningful component, but there's not really anything the Fed can do about that since it is arguably the reason that housing inflation is as elevated as it is, the rate hike cycle that it has wrought over the course of 2022 and a little bit into 2023, has effectively pushed both buyers and sellers out of the housing market. Sellers don't want to sell because they don't want to refinance on uh, much more expensive terms. That means the price hasn't fallen. That's pushed out buyers. And so arguably for the housing part of this to get unstuck, the Fed's got to start cutting but it's not in a position to start cutting until something happens with this core services situation. And this is the part that's been sticky. Goods, as we can see here, if we squint hard enough, the gray bit on the bottom here below zero, the goods component is actually now a disinflationary force. Goods prices are actually falling at this point. It's services that represent the lasting issue. And so... As we look at this, we are looking at expectations that for the fourth consecutive month, core inflation, the dotted green line there that mainly echoes what's going on in the service sector, you can 
see here it mainly uh, is a reflection of this right here, that it's going to hold unchanged at 2.8% year on year once again. Obviously, this is not what the Fed wants to see. What it would like to see is disinflation resuming. And indeed, if we look at the CPI data, the analog that led into this announcement, we can see, again, if we look closely, that for the month of April, this inflation did resume when we look at CPI. So what we saw, at least on year-on-year -year numbers, is a move down on the core from 3.7 to 3.8, or uh, from uh, 3.7 to 3.6, rather, and even a little bit of a downtick on the headline from 3.5 to 3.4, which, of course, the markets liked. That seems to be a bit encouraging ahead of the PCE data, at least at the surface, until you get into the weeds a little bit. And then things start looking like the Fed is perhaps no closer to cutting interest rates despite this outcome. So the Fed has made no secret of looking at annualized three- and six-month inflation rates to get a sense of where the trajectory is going near term. In other words, they take what inflation's done for three months, they annualize that to extrapolate it and see, okay, over the past three months, here's where annual inflation is trending. For the past six months, here's where annual inflation is doing uh, the same, and we can get that from the headline, we can get it from the core. So consider on the bottom here, this is the actual month-on-month change in here, headline, and core, CPI. And you can see that from February to March to April, we're marching lower. Headline is getting lower. Core is getting lower. But when we look at the rate at which this is occurring, things don't look nearly as encouraging. Up here, this is the three-month annualized rate for CPI headline. This yellow one is the annualized three-month rate for core. This is the six-month rate for headline. This is the six-month rate for core. Notice what's going on here. The three-month rate for headline is actually going up. So although these numbers are getting smaller month to month, the rate at which this is occurring is going in the wrong direction. The three-month inflation rate annualized isn't pointing to disinflation. It's pointing the wrong way. It's the same thing for the six-month as well. Notice these bars higher in April than they were here or here. Jump over to core six-month CPI. Again, higher. Higher in March than it was in February, higher in April than it was in March. The only real place where you get a sliver of positivity is the three-month annualized core CPI rate, which is basically unched in April versus February after a pop in March. So, as you look at this, what you find is that, yes, in year-on-year -year terms, CPI is telling you disinflation has cautiously resumed. But when you look at three- and six-month dynamics, you find that mostly you are not at all in a place to say confidently that you are on a glide path to lower inflation rates. And as we've seen from the Fed, the key here is, are they confident to begin cutting because they don't want to cut and then hike? Hence, they're standing pat saying, listen, we're just going to be hands off here. We're going to let time do our work for us. 
There is not a consistency here to tell the Fed we can confidently say inflation is on the course we want it to be on. We're prepared to begin cutting. What's more, if you look at the Cleveland Fed's model of inflation, and this is uh, the PCE model here, if we look closely, we can see that for the past year, well, starting from the beginning of this year, let's say, let's keep it modest. This is a moving target, after all. January, February, March. The actual PCE index, year on year, the blue line, has outpaced what has been the Cleveland Fed's model. And you can see that in seeing this red line, the core, outpacing the green line, the modeled core. So the Cleveland Fed has been, in their model, understating inflation, realized rather than expected by the model, basically every month so far this year. What you also see is rising PCE inflation expectations for both April and May. So this model that has been saying we are going to give you a forecast on PCE and then actual PCE comes out and for three months it's beating the model, it's higher than the model, this model isn't saying we're going to stay pat or even follow CPI lower. It's saying we're going higher. And if the tendency has been to overshoot even that, well, then there's significant upside surprise risk. Why does this matter for the market? That's sort of the natural next question. We can see here that since the beginning of the year, the markets have found a tailwind in, in saying the Fed is going to cut rates more than the Fed itself is forecasting. Here's what the market it, is baking in at the start of this year, almost six cuts, even by, by about eight basis points of flirtation with seven. The Fed is saying three. As long as the market is more dovish than the Fed, stocks like it. Better than expected, U.S. economic data starts coming out, so the tally of rate cuts starts to fizzle out of the outlook. But the markets still see the Fed as likely to have to adjust to a more dovish setting until you get here, where the object of speculation flips. The markets and the Fed be become aligned right there. And the moment the market keeps going into a more hawkish direction and is now on the hawkish side of the Fed's forecast, stocks come down. Note, they come down until you rebalance here to about one cut. At this point, the markets are pricing in 27 basis points in easing. That's one 25 basis point cut. You can see that's this right here and about an 8% chance for a second, so negligible. You're pinned to one cut. Now, you can see that as you get a little bit inward on this, stocks stumble. But you haven't really moved very far. Over the course of basically six weeks, the outlook for 2024 has held at about one cut, plus or minus a few basis points. The oscillation range in here has been about 18 basis points top to bottom. Not a big deal. This has become basically anchored. So why are stocks getting a little bit spicy here? Well, if the Fed is saying that they're going to keep higher for longer, what's longer mean? Well, if you're stuck at one cut for this year, then you have to start focusing on next year. And the market seemingly is reading what the Fed is saying by saying, okay, so you're not going to not cut, 
you're still cutting. You've just gone to push out your cutting expectations further out in time. You're going to do it later. You're going to hold higher for longer, which is another way of saying you're going to be cutting later. And if you're already benchmarked basically for six weeks at one cut for this year, where is that extra movement coming from? Well, next year. So what happens here that stocks are rebounding? The outlook for next year in the yellow bars here starts getting more dovish. In the orange line is the cumulative amount of cuts between this year and next year. And what you see is from around here, late April into early May, you anchor for next year, but you start to get further easing baked out for next year. So for 2024, steady. For 2025, more dovish, which makes the cumulative line go deeper into negative territory. Notice the turning point here matching the turning point here. Because this is what we've been doing, essentially, for the past week and a half. The market seemingly has decided that they overshot it here, and they've reversed basically back to where they started. So now we're looking at a cumulative 89 basis points between this year and next. And it's the reduction of next year's cut odds, because the ones for this year have been basically standing still, that seems to have spooked the markets. So the focus is now shifting further in time. What we've seen since then is hotter than expected U.S. PMI data. You can see the, the, the markets were not anticipating this very sharp jump in service sector growth. This got reported just last week. The expectations were for numbers closer to 51 for services and composite. And as it turns out, we jumped to the strongest pace of service sector, and overall economic activity growth in a year. And of course, a brisk uh, speed of economic activity growth comes with inflationary pressure. We also see that, as if right on time, right at the beginning of April, we can see U.S. economic data begins to deteriorate relative to expectations. What do we see is happening at that time? This dovish shift. Here's mid-April, right there. So just as U.S. economic data starts to get soggier, the market goes, yeah, okay, maybe you don't want to cut now because the near-term inflation numbers look sticky, but you're doing it next year because this economy is turning. Well, what have we seen more recently? This thing has come back around and is now back through its 20-day moving average, which seems to have been the point where lasting reversals occur. We break it here, 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 there, and now again here. And every major instance where we get through the 20-day moving average, which is about a month's worth of days here, four weeks, five days in a week, that's about a 20-day um, period. When U.S. economic data seems to roll through its monthly average then, whatever it's doing re relative to expectations, there seems to be something of a change. Well, if this is the way that we're heading now in U.S. economic data is on a path toward improvement from here relative to forecasts. That is, again, less scope for cutting. What does this mean for PCE? If we come in basically in line with expectations or even a little bit lower to echo what we saw in CP, 
FBI unless we can build this amount of confidence that most of these things start looking like the Fed can, with an easy heart, begin to cut, we don't have much of a change of pace. And the economic data seems to be changing to give us higher inflation. So as long as we don't get an outcome that meaningfully changes this dynamic, as long as we get either something in line and maybe even a little bit softer, but not a lot softer, stock markets might be in trouble because this higher for longer narrative might have room to keep going. Whereas only a very soft PCE outcome might revive the rally in earnest. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday. We'll be back to that regular schedule next week. Of course, disrupted a little bit by a holiday this week, so a bit of a shortened one. Uh, that's right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at the Wall Street close and what it might mean thereafter. I'm back on next week for Futures Power Hour with Chris on Fridays, on with Victor Jones on Wednesdays for The Price of Truth, on with Victor and Tom for First Call on Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of TastyLive.com, and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. See you next week.